Hello. I'd like to welcome Pavel Yusufovic here. We're glad to have you here in this conversation with the Robin Academy. I hope we're going to have a good time and be able to deliver some of your thoughts and experiences to all, to all the students over the year. In the beginning, can you tell us when did you start in the system programming field and short brief about your resume and most important works that you have done? And as you know, I would say short brief because we would be here all night if we decided to talk about all of your accomplishments. Uh, well, I, I've been in the Windows uh, system programming space for uh, almost uh, 30 years, I think, well, maybe 27 or so. Um, and so I, I started in the old days of Windows NT4 uh, back in 96, 97. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been in that space uh, since, I guess, to one extent or another. Uh, sometimes uh, writing uh, code, sometimes uh, writing books and things like that. Um, and I still enjoy coding very much. I think it's a very, uh, very creative experience. You're creating something out of nothing. So I, that's why I find it so um, interesting and, and compelling, uh, regardless of whether that's actually system programming or some other uh, type of programming, really. Thank you. You're really being humble about all of your accomplishments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have a general question from you. And growing up, was there anyone you looked up to? And is, was there someone who inspired you to enter these important fields such as uh, system programming and Windows internals? Um, I can't say that uh, I, there was someone because in those days, that was the late uh, 80s and early 90s, there was even no internet, so it was uh, very difficult to know what is actually uh, out there. Um, and um, it just felt uh, interesting to see um, how to write code, how to create uh, applications. Um, I remember when I was uh, younger, when I actually started with computers in the, uh, in the early 80s, um, it was like magic. Uh, you had these little boxes. It's not like today's uh, powerful machines were very, uh, computers like Commodore 64 and uh, Spectrum, things like that. And you could make things happen on the screen. I think it was that kind of magic that uh, drew me uh, into programming. Uh, later on, I realized I really uh, want to understand how things work, those which was just uh, the thing that I was working with, it wasn't intentional at the time. Um, so I just started with that and tried to enhance my understanding, to understand how things work. I actually have a background in electronics and, and electricity, so it kind of also made sense how is the hardware connected to the software, so just pure software, how are all these things working. So I find that very uh, fascinating. And uh, as part of that, I'm also trying to, uh, to share what I know uh, it's just a way for me to express myself uh, as well. Nice. Thank you. Um, I have another question, which uh, you mentioned before, about, you know, uh, being in the 80s and there weren't many computers around and internet around. And, you know, you kind of self-studied and you studied on uh, subjects yourself. And, you know, nowadays with the growth of internet and uh, all the sources around the world and, you know, the online courses and young people being into the internet, uh, many people would uh, like to, you know, just skip books and stick to only online courses, you know, in sources such as YouTube and etc. Books such as Windows Internals, Windows Kernel Programming and many more. Uh, what do you think is the best way to, you know, study and learn, uh, especially in this field, by the young people who are trying to, you know, start this journey? Does well, reading a book uh, work perfectly? Yeah, so at the end of the day, it's really a personal thing. Uh, different people learn different ways. Um, I, for example, learn well by doing. When I'm writing code, I learn a lot more than just reading. And the thing is that uh, I think many people today try to find shortcuts. They're thinking that maybe they'll see a, a YouTube video of five minutes, they will become experts in some way. Uh, but that doesn't really work. And at some point, you can, you can start with these things, short sure, to get acquaintance to, to the topic you're trying to learn. But at some point, you'll hit a barrier that you understand, well, I, I don't really understand what's going on. How can I 
take it to the next step, to the next level. I think the advantage of books is that they usually cover more material in a more methodical way. So you started with something, you build upon that something and so on. So yes, it requires more patience. Books are bigger uh, for sure. But again, it, it, uh, even books are not enough, really. You can read as, 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 many, as, as many books as you like, but if you don't actually do something with it, it it's, not, it's not going to work out. And so I think, uh, again, every, every person learns differently, but at the end of the day, I think the only the thing that makes uh, a difference is doing. Another tip I can give to those that want uh, to learn or get into this space is teach. And so essentially, if you learn something, uh, you don't have to teach that uh, publicly. You just talk to someone else and say, hey, let me explain you what I've just learned. And once you try to explain something, you'll quickly realize whether you understand that or not. And they say, well, I actually didn't understand that. Let me go back to that. So when you're teaching, when you're uh, trying to explain how something works or how something behaves, all the things just come up. And then you realize very quickly whether you understood what you read or watched or, or not. And even I would even say, go and explain that to an eight-year-old, try to explain that in the simplest possible terms. If you're starting to get uh, complex language and then trying to use the complex phrases, it's probably not a good idea. You probably don't understand that well enough. So that's one reason I'm teaching uh, because it forces me to understand really well what I am actually che teaching. True, thank you. Uh, as you may know, we are a cybersecurity training academy with so many young students who are looking up to people like you who are very successful and famous in this field and in this industry. And considering your experiences in authorizing so many books in this field and, you know, your resume and being an instructor at Pentest Academy and now at the Trainsec.net being a co-founder at there, I'd like you to give some educational tips for students in this field who want to go really deeper and become a professional security researcher. Do you have any think, tips for think, that? Yeah, I, I can, I, well, I can say the following. I think the most fundamental, the most important thing is to have a good grounding of the fundamentals. Uh, I know that many people in the security space try to start from the top, try to like uh, learn how to develop malware or to how to pen test or things like that, but they don't have the fundamentals. And that's, I think, the thing that is sorely missing. Because if you have good understanding of the fundamentals, you can learn anything. You can branch to any particular thing because you say, oh, well, I know how that works. I know the uh, building blocks it, it's built upon. And so I, what I would say is uh, don't look for shortcuts. There are no shortcuts, really, if you want to be really good. You can always uh, learn to write some scripts and use tools that exist that won't make you really expert. Just make you a script kitty, like all these. Uh, you, you just use existing tools. It's okay. And if that level is fine for you, then sure, it's fine. But if you really want to take it to the next level, you have to go down. You have to start from the basics understand what computers really are, how they're actually, how they actually work, how all these mechanisms built one upon another. I mean, all the world is really about abstractions. And when we write code in a language like C or C++ or C Sharp or Python or whatever, it's an abstraction over something else. And then there's the processor, and the processor is also an abstraction over transistors and other stuff. So you always work in layers of abstractions, and that's fine. But usually when you want to understand something and work with something in an expert level, you have to understand at least one or two levels below of the abstraction you're actually using. So if you're using Python, you need to understand C uh, because it, it's built on top of that. If you use C, you need to understand assembly language. And so if you know at least one level down, then you're in a good position to move to, to wherever you want, really. Thank you. Uh, I have a question which uh, kind of might seem uh, a bit uh, out of the ordinary, but as you may know, there are so many series and movies like Mr. Robot, for example, where there is a smart, cool, and lonely hacker sitting in a corner and, you know, just starts hacking everyone and everything and makes a huge impact and change in the world. And this portraits being uh, of a hacker in the media that is shown to us 
it's kind of showing the offensive side of cybersecurity really interesting and fun to especially teenagers. And they all want to become this cool hacker who hacks everything and everyone. And uh, on the other side, as you know, there isn't a big focus on the defensive side of this field, as uh, you know, such as in the fields of threat hunting, SOC, and malware analysis. And do you think the defensive side of cybersecurity is an interesting uh, subject to focus on, and is it as interesting as the offensive side for the young people and Besides that, are they ready for it, or do they need some levels of maturity to enter, to enter those areas? Well, I think that both of these sides are actually two sides of the same thing. I mean, if you want to be a, a good um, attacker, you have to understand the defense. If you want to be a good defender, you have to understand attackers. And so it's actually two coins of, of the same thing. And obviously, there are many big companies that deal with the defensive security, like Microsoft and CrowdStrike and, uh, and Sentinel One. All these companies, they're all focused on defenses. And obviously, defense is, is much more difficult than attacking in some respect because mm -hmm. attackers only have to succeed once. Defenders have to succeed all the time. Uh, and that's why I think one of the problems in, in this day and age is that defenders are actually losing. Uh, because they have so many attacks and one will just uh, make it through. So I think it's more challenging than attacks, probably, using uh, working in defense areas. And, 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 and essentially, I think every good company that does defensive work also has a red team uh, to perform uh, offensive work. So they can test it themselves at the very least to see whether they, they can uh, come up with a good. Um, so... I understand that indeed the various uh, uh, media and movies and things like that perhaps seem like the hackers sitting and doing stuff like randomly uh, hitting keys and uh, manages to, uh, I don't know, to uh, infiltrate anything. Uh, that might seem uh, cool, but it is just the movies. And usually hackers are organized teams. It's not a... It's, uh, it's very unlikely to be just a single person sitting in some basement. It's usually a well-funded team, and they're viewing that just like work. Just like defenders come to work to, to build products, then attackers come to their work to build uh, attack uh, tools and, and all that. So it's, it's really two parts of the same thing. Um, and I realized that it may look cooler uh, to be an attacker, but it's actually... Um, well, it is, I think, cool to be a defender as well. And it's, it's super important in this day because everything is attackable nowadays. Thank you. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, companies and organizations having the defensive and offensive sides and uh, considering this uh, growth and spread of internet and online data all over the world, Many companies might be in the danger of cyber attacks and threats all over the world. And considering your experience on many big companies, uh, such as working in the Microsoft Windows Defender team, what actions do you think are being taken and used nowadays to decrease these problems and threats? And are they really enough to, you know, be able to defend against the threats all over the world and the threats that are happening right now in this world? I guess the, the fact of the matter is that it's not enough. We see that uh, all the time. There are always a new attack or data being stolen, things like that. So obviously, um, defenders are not good enough uh, today. Um, so obviously, every defense-rated company, they try to make their tools better, uh, and their detections are smarter using AI or other OS mechanisms or whatever. But there's, there's also a few basic problems because in many cases, uh, these attacks succeed not because uh, the defense uh, tools are not good enough, but because of human nature. Uh, usually some kind of social engineering and humans really are the weak link here. Uh, and so it's a lot about, um, uh, about education, There's teaching people about the dangers of, uh, of the online world because uh, many people work in accounting or marketing and they don't necessarily have a security mindset. So they're not 
necessarily realizing the, the dangers that lurk in, on the online world. On the other side of things, uh, certain companies like Microsoft, they're always trying to enhance the security capabilities of the OS, not just uh, the tools like Defender or the uh, ATP or whatever uh, name they give that. Um, they're trying to build new mechanisms in the OS to try to make the operating system better protected and make uh, attacks harder. Um, but I think this is just the combination. On the one hand, you can have crazy uh, defenses and OSs, but on the other side, you have humans. And humans are much easier to crack uh, than, uh, uh, than machines, probably. So uh, currently, I would say uh, the world is losing. Um, and there's lots of things uh, that needs to be done in order to improve uh, the security stance, uh, which, of course, many people are working on. But still, at, at this point, I would say uh, defenders are losing. They're definitely losing because we can see all over the news that every organization and companies are just being keep getting attacked. And, you know, we can see that. Thank you. Uh, speaking of defensive solutions, what are your thoughts on the antiviruses and EDRs up to date? And which one do you prefer and do you think is a leader and flagship in this industry? <laughs> do you have a favorite well, one? Uh, I would say that I'm not keeping track of exactly which, uh, what features every EDR vendor provides. Um, it's not that interesting uh, it, to me. And in fact, I... It's just not something I'm uh, dealing with uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, I know that uh, every uh, cyber security company, and I've met a few, uh, worked at a few, uh, they're doing their best. They really are trying their best to, to come up with the best possible defenses, but there's also a trade-off. There's always a trade-off because the visibility that you have is limited. If you have a kernel driver, for example, in, in that company, well, the kernel driver can also be attacked, maybe by other kernel components, maybe because of some other vulnerable driver. So they're on equal footing, which means that uh, the attackers can definitely win uh, in this scenario. And this is why Microsoft created this uh, secure world and all VT, uh, VTL1, all these kinds of stuff to try to, to protect kernel code from, uh, from attacks, so because that's uh, kind of a super kernel. Um, so we have all these uh, mechanisms, but that's not even good enough because even if you could see things even um, more deeply, that would take much more resources. And so if you think of, uh, of security products, they have, they have to be very lightweight. Um, and sometimes I see Defender on my system just jumps to 30 or 40% processing power. I mean, what is that? I mean, this is not a product that people want, would like to use. Use Defender, it's free, so why not? But I'm, not, I'm sure it's, it's not the only one. And so the, there is a trade-off here uh, because you can't just take all the processing power of the computer. The user will just drop the, the product and, and say, I don't want that. Um, and I think this is where new approaches are more relevant, such as using hardware-based uh, hardware protections. Uh, try to put mechanisms within the increased visibility, seeing things that you cannot, you, know, you can see before it actually gets through the actual operating system. So you can be below attackers and you're actually undetectable. And you can use resources of the hardware without taking resources of the client machine. So you have more flexibility and, and freedom to do more processing, to use more algorithms. And I think this is the, uh, the way moving forward uh, because the software has its limits uh, in, in this space because of the resources that are needed and, and, uh, and the visibility, which is, uh, at the end of the day, limited. True, thanks. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, Windows Defender might be really enough for so many users, but uh, many people might assume and believe that uh, many third-party antiviruses are performing much better than the Windows Defender itself, which is built in. And do you think is that true? And if that's true, why is that happening? Because Microsoft is the biggest computer company in the world, and they surely can provide a great antivirus and defending solution. 
Uh, yeah, that's a, I guess that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer, but I can guess. So first, Microsoft is a big company. They're dealing with lots of things and they're not focusing just on Defender or any kind of antivirus uh, product. Other companies, they're just their main business. They're, this is all they're doing and trying to bring uh, more value because they know they have to uh, uh, compete with Microsoft, which own the platform and providing Defender kind of for free. So they have to be really good at what they're doing. And of course, it's not just the antivirus uh, software itself that is installed, the agent installed in the machine. It's also about the entire ecosystem, how you get notifications about things that are happening. How, how uh, helpful do you, do you find this? Because sometimes one of the problems that you have so much data flowing into some uh, uh, SOC station or something, and now the analyst needs to steal through like crazy amount of data, try to figure out whether there's in fact a threat or not. And if you have lots of false positive, that's also a very big problem in the security space. Because it's easy to say, well, it looks suspicious to me, but if everything looks suspicious, then it's, it's you're drowning with data and you'll never see what really is the something that is really a true attack. So I think one of the of the um, uh, goals of antivirus companies and products is to minimize false positives. On the one, on the one hand, on the other hand, they don't want to miss uh, real attacks. So it's a, again, it's a challenge. And then they need to provide some tools to kind of try to filter or maybe analyze that in some way to try to uh, point the analyst to the correct to something to actually focus on. Otherwise, I know of of, of, of several. Uh, people working in that space that are just so uh, like swarmed with uh, notifications, they just can't uh, get to everything. And even once they do, the attack may already be uh, happening, working for days until they actually find something that points to the attack. So it's, it's all this ecosystem. It, it, it's very difficult, especially as uh, computers run more and more software, more things running at the same time. Uh, it's very difficult to to deal with this space. Obviously, it's not easy. Otherwise, someone would already already figured it out and we wouldn't have any uh, cybersecurity issues. True, thanks. I have a semi-technical question and you can answer shortly because I'm sure uh, we don't have a lot of time left. You know, there are numerous people out there that are considering that Linux is much safer than Windows. And given your deep understanding and knowledge of OS internals, can you explain your opinion and uh, what do you think about this matter? Is it really that much safer than Windows, given the recent mitigations and security improvements? Uh, well, I'm not a Linux expert, so I can't say for sure, but uh, if you just... Think about it, since there are many more Windows than, you, than Linux out there, Windows is a much bigger target. So most hackers will focus on Windows and less so on Linux. So that uh, always brings more pressure to the Windows ecosystem. So I think that if uh, the same resources would have been uh, uh, targeting Linux, they will find more vulnerabilities just like they find in Windows. I'm not sure it's actually uh, safer, but it's definitely safer maybe in practice because less attacks are targeted. That's completely true as well. Thank you. And as our final question, I have a question about, uh, you know, education in general. And do you think, is it necessary to have certain academic education in order to be able to become an expert in the field of security researching? Can someone become a professional in this field by only self-studying or taking courses out of the academic situations? Um, I think so. I don't think the academic world is necessary to, to gain deep understanding of what's going on. I mean, I've been in university for four years, and I can tell you uh, I would like uh, at least three of those years back. Uh, it's, it was just uh, not really that useful. And in many cases, the, uh, the teachings are kind of uh, old, uh, outdated. Uh, professors there sometimes they know of some operating system in, from the 60s or 70s. I mean, I mean, who who cares about that? And and um, I find that this is definitely not uh, necessary. Uh, being there, I'm that's why I'm never looking at to take a, to try to uh, do a master's degree or PhD. It's really not needed. You want to be good, uh, you can learn to be good. You don't need to have some kind of 
certificate saying you're good. Uh, just uh, be good and that would be it. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your time with us, Powell. It's been a pleasure to be able to have a conversation with you. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to as well. And thank you really much. If you have any points or tips it would be uh, that we could be using, thank you. I would be glad to have it. Well, I, I think I've provided a few tips uh, along this conversation. Uh, if people have something to ask and find me on Twitter and, and feel free to ask. I'll, I'll do my best to, to help out. Thank you so much for the time. Hope you have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.